Good morning and welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I am Pastor Jason Van Bemmel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. It's day 550. It's the 4th of July if you're watching this on schedule with us. And uh, we are on vacation, family vacation, at uh, my sister-in-law's lake house in North Georgia. And you can't see it at all through the camera because it's all washed out, but there's a beautiful scene behind me of trees and water and blue sky and... Anyway, I hope you're doing well this morning. We're on day 550 of our three-year journey through the Word of God, one chapter at a time, and we come to 1 Chronicles 21, David's census, his sinful census uh, issued out of pride and yet used by God to provide in a very important way for God's people with sinful consequences, but also with um, God's good provision through it. So let's pray and ask the Lord's help as we look at this chapter today of the today. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the ways in which you lead us and teach us through your word every day. We pray that you be with us and teach us and grow us. Help us to walk by faith with you today. Help us not to um, help us not to give in to our flesh or listen to the world or go astray after Satan's lies, but help us to listen to and be grounded in and guided by you and your truth and your spirit. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. First Chronicles, or chapter 21. Chronicles, or that's not a book of the Bible. All right. First Chronicles 21. Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the army, Go, number Israel from Beersheba to Dan, and bring me a report that I may know their number. But Joab said, May the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are. Are they not, my lord the king, all of them my lord's servants? Why then should my lord require this? Why should it be a cause of guilt for Israel? But the king's word prevailed against Joab. So Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came back to Jerusalem. And Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to David. In all Israel there were 1,100,000 men who drew the sword, and in all Judah, 470,000 who drew the sword. But he did not include Levi and Benjamin in the numbering, for the king's command was abhorrent to Joab. But God was displeased with this thing. And he struck Israel, and David said to God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing, but now please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have acted very foolishly. And the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you. Choose one of them, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, choose what you will, either three years of famine or three months of devastation by your foes while the sword of your enemies overtakes you, or else three days of the sword of the Lord, pestilence on the land, with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great, but do not let me fall into the hand of men. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell. And God sent the angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. But as he was about to destroy it, the Lord saw, and he relented from the calamity. And he said to the angel who was working destruction, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven, and in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell upon their faces. And David said to God, Was it not I who gave the command to number the people? It is I who have sinned and done this great evil, but these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand, O Lord my God, be against me and against my father's house, but do not let the plague be on your people. Now the angel of the Lord had commanded Gad to say to David, 
that David should go up and raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word, which he had spoken in the name of the Lord. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. He turned and saw the angel and his four sons who were with him, and who who were sorry, and his four sons who were with him hid themselves. And David came to Ornan. Ornan looked and saw David and went out from the threshing floor and paid homage to David with his face to the ground. And David said to Ornan, Give me the site of the threshing floor, that I may build on it an altar to the Lord. Give it to me at its full price, that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Ornan said to David, Take it, and let my lord the king do what seems good to him. See, I give the oxen for burnt offerings, and the threshing sledges for the wood, and the wheat for a grain offering. I give it all. But King David said to Ornan, No, but I will buy them for the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours, nor offer burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David put or, paid Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight for the site. And David built there an altar to the Lord, and presented burnt offerings and peace offerings, and called on the Lord. And the Lord answered him with fire from heaven upon the altar of burnt offering. Then the Lord commanded the angel, and he put his sword back into his sheath. At that time, when David saw that the Lord had answered him at the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite, he sacrificed there for the tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses had made in the wilderness and the altar of burnt offering, were at that time in the high place at Gibeon. But David could not go before it to inquire of God, for he was afraid of the sword of the angel of the Lord. And I'll go ahead and read the first verse of chapter 22. Then David said, Here shall be the house of the Lord God, and here the altar of burnt offerings for Israel. So that's First Chronicles 21 and the first verse of 22. And this is the second great sin of David as king. The first and greatest sin of David as king was, of course, uh, having an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba and then arranging for the murder of Uriah the Hittite and that had disastrous consequences. Uh, the child that uh, Bathsheba was pregnant with died. Also, obviously, Uriah died. David was convicted and repented. Um, but the sword would not depart from his house, and later that would lead to Absalom's rebellion and the overthrow of David. So we saw in that case, right, that David sinned grievously. There were disastrous consequences that came from his sin, David was forgiven of his sin. As soon as he repented, he was forgiven. He learned a lot from his sin in ways that have blessed God's people for centuries because he wrote Psalm 51, and then he wrote Psalm 32, and we can still read and reflect on those, and they teach us how to repent, and they teach us the blessing of being forgiven. But there were these disastrous consequences for his family, and yet the Lord was sovereign over all of it because out of that relationship with Bathsheba, Solomon came and he was to be the next king of Israel and the one who would build the temple in Jerusalem. Not the ultimate temple of God, but that temple in Jerusalem. We see that same pattern repeated here. David sins grievously against the Lord. He's warned not to. He has an opportunity to turn away. He decides to go and sin anyway. He sins. He sins grievously. God immediately brings consequences. He has to choose whether or not he's going to have... Um, He's going to have three years of famine, verse 12, or three months of devastation by your foes while the sword of your enemies overtakes you, or else three days of the sword of the Lord, pestilence on the land with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territories of Israel. Now, David doesn't explicitly choose which one, but he does say, let me fall into the hand of the Lord for his mercy is great. Let me not fall into the hand of man. So he doesn't want three months of fleeing uh, from his foes, right? Um, and so he gets these three days of famine, which um, is cut short because of the mercy of the Lord. But you have sin, you have disastrous consequences from that sin. You also do have David learning a lesson, and a lesson that benefits God's people even down to this day, which is you shall not put the Lord your God to the test, 
don't trust in your own resources, but trust in the Lord. So we learn things coming out of David's sin with Bathsheba. We learn other things coming out of David's sin of this great census. And in the end, God uses it to provide for his people. The sin with Bathsheba, God provided for his people a king in Solomon. And in this sin, uh, God provides for his people a location that's going to be the location of the temple. Now, all of this, the patterns that we see in these two different great sins of David, they teach us important things about our own sin the sin that is in our lives, and how it is wrong. It's wrong. Sin is wrong. It brings disastrous consequences upon us and upon those we love. But God forgives. When we confess our sin and we ask for forgiveness, God sins immediately. But that doesn't mean there's no consequences. But also God is sovereign over our sin, and he even provides blessing even through our sin. That is a tremendous comfort, not an excuse to sin because it's still wrong and there's still disastrous consequences, but it is a tremendous comfort in that it allows us to know that just because we sin greatly and in a way that is not according to God's will and is not ultimately pleasing to God, that doesn't mean that we've somehow removed ourselves out of the will of God and out of his ability to bring about good. In other words, Romans 8.28, when it says God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose, it does also encompass our sin. God is sovereign in his good sovereignty, even over our sin. And again, we should know that is not a justification to sin. It does not mean that we will be spared disastrous consequences from our sin. It also helps us distinguish between the difference of being forgiven of the guilt of our sin so that we won't be punished eternally. Jesus paid for all of our sins on the cross. They are all washed away by his precious blood. We are forgiven completely and fully when we confess our sins in the name of Jesus because his blood covers it all. But forgiveness is not the same thing as no consequences. There will come consequences and they will be grievous and they will be unpredictable sometimes and they will be far greater than we thought. I'm sure David didn't really envision 70,000 people of Israel dying in really less than a day. But that's what happens. And so there's much for us to learn from this. But I think one of the things we need to learn that's going to be helpful to us is to remember, if you've sinned, okay, if you have sinned and sinned greatly, And you've suffered great consequences because of your sin. Perhaps consequences that have lasted for years or decades. Do not think that that means that your sin has removed you from God's good sovereignty over your life. That God is not able to bring good to you even through that sin. Because God is good and God is sovereign when we suffer unjustly when we go through trials that we don't understand, and when we sin grievously, throughout all of it, God remains good and sovereign. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your unfailing goodness and sovereignty. We look to you. We trust you. We need you. Strengthen our faith in you. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight. Help us to trust in you and not in our own resources. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's First Chronicles 21. Thanks for joining me. Tomorrow we will continue on. I think we're going back to Hebrews tomorrow. Have a blessed day in the Lord.